there is so much about the universe that we don't understand. Almost every day, there is a new discovery that makes us stop and reevaluate what we think we know. There's a very long history here of education and outreach, and this is the premier science facility. There's nowhere else students can go in West Virginia to learn about the things they learn about when they come here. Students come here, many of them have no idea what to expect, and you're driving through the countryside and you suddenly see this massive dish just sitting in the middle of nowhere with mountains as backdrop, and I think just just the sight of it, even if I don't understand much about astronomy, they realize, you know, wow, this is really cool, this is a big deal. It's just the best advertisement ever for, for being a scientist. So the idea behind the PSC is to give students an experience of being a real scientist. We originally started focusing on West Virginia students because we know there are lots of rural students in West Virginia who don't have a lot of experience um, with technology, with computers, with astronomy. The idea though is to just increase the number of them that are thinking seriously about careers in science, technology, engineering, math, in, in what we call the STEM fields. Okay, I just sort of told you the end product and I didn't get into any of the other steps. I think one of the reasons that pulsars are so great for this particular project is because they are so exotic and it's just so easy to get high school students interested in these objects. With pulsars, I still have a hard time, you know, imagining them because they're so extreme. I mean, how are you supposed to imagine something that has a gravitational field that's like a million times higher than the Earth's? Fernando, you should participate. So, um, we're going to act out we're going to act out the life cycle of a star. And you're <laughs> gas and dust in interstellar space right now. You're, you're just a nebula. <laughs> you can't see me, I'm just a nebula. <laughs> Pulsars are the remains of stars that have died in supernova explosions. So when a massive star reaches the end of its life, it runs out of fuel. Okay, okay, but now the, the core is starting to run out of fuel, you guys. The core can't support itself against gravity, it collapses. <laughs> okay, so uh, now you guys are still pushing, you're still radiant. Oh. The outer layers fly off in a supernova explosion and that core becomes a neutron star. It's made entirely of neutrons. They spin very rapidly. Um, they have very high magnetic fields and these magnetic fields make them bright radio sources. And their radio mission is beamed. They have a north and south magnetic pole. And so the mission is beamed along these poles. And when they rotate, we see radio pulses. So they're kind of like little lighthouses in space. So the high school students come here over the summer for a workshop. And these are students who haven't been involved with the program at all. What impressed me most was that we were expected to do it by ourselves, to go to the telescope and collect data without any teacher or supervision, any adult supervision. And I, was a, I had just finished my sophomore year and I was like, really, they're trusting us with a 40-foot telescope? Often when they come here, they have no idea what they're getting into. Their high school teachers recruited them. They're kind of lukewarm. And then when they use the 40-foot telescope, we have to drag them away. It can be, it's 3 a.m. and they're saying, I don't want to go to bed. I want to stay and get more data with the telescope. Oh, cool. Yeah. Okay. So, Adam, can you log in the database? Adam's? Um, or Canada? I do. Yeah, because I mean, it's, it's really, um, it's kind of messy, but then again, it's there clearly. So why, what made you think this is a Pulsar candidate? Because here, it looks like it has... I came back from the one-week training session at West Virginia, and we decided to continue the club at school to expand the opportunity of Pulsar astronomy. And what you can see 
between these two graphs is that there's more I like the fact that you're not really focusing on the textbook the approach to teaching math and um, science. You're looking at, uh, well, this is the information you have to learn, but the reason you have to learn is because you're going to have to apply it when you go at 3 a.m. into a telescope and you have no help there. So it's really exciting and it's applicable, and I think people realize the importance of um, research beyond, you know, kind of things that are drier on paper. You're using the world as a lab versus um, some type of simulation or the textbook. And discovering a star is incredible. Oh, it's electrifying. I mean, it's like you discover something that nobody else has ever seen in the universe and who has um, an opportunity to do that, you know, in day-to-day -day life. I thought it was very exciting, but then um, as I was doing the data, I kind of started figuring out that it's not the discovery that's the most important, it's the process. So Gary Marchini, who knows Gary? Getting to Green Bank was kind of a motivation too, because it kind of showed you like what real research was and like what they actually did. So like the first thing everybody asks is like, do you get to name it? And no, but I still like know it's my pulsar. It's kind of what motivated me to like actually go into physics. I think without it, if, without finding that, or without even knowing about the program, I wouldn't have gone to college for physics or even probably science. Green Bank, without it, a lot of people would lose. And um, pretend you're like the radio telescope, and so as I'm coming you know, toward or past you, you, you sense my signal, so it's like beep, and then like beep, and I do this really regularly, beep,